School in Cardiff, Steve Fairhurst, on issues Maybe I just told you a bunch of lies five minutes ago. Solving all the problems of physics. <laughs> so now, come on. Okay, yeah, so, so, so thanks for that, and, and thanks for in, inviting us to, to speak here. So, so I guess today I, I really want to talk about um, observing spinning neutron star black hole mergers with, with second generation gravitational wave observatories, which is work I've done in collaboration with, with the people here. Um, so just to, to try and give a bit of motivation then. So in sort of the last decade, or at least the initial um, LIGO and, and Virgo instruments were, was, were basically taking data on and off, and, and we managed the sort of unprecedented task of, of achieving two years of coincident gravitational wave data observation with two detectors operating at, at their design sensitivity. Um, unfortunately, we, we didn't see any gravitational waves th despite this, um, but we, we remain very optimistic that we will be making gravitational wave observations uh, in the very near future. Um, the second generation gravitational wave facility, um, Advanced LIGO, is due to begin its operations in sort of 2015. Um, it'll then work towards reaching its design sensitivity, which we expect to get in 2018 to, to 2020. Um, this will be closely followed by the French-Italian gravitational wave observatory, Virgo, um, maybe operating about a year schedule behind Advanced LIGO at the moment. Um, and then eventually this will be followed by detectors in India and detectors in Japan, um, giving us a, a worldwide network of, of gravitational wave observatories to really let us uh, observe a very new almost spectrum of, of astronomy. Um, the primary observational target for, for these kind of observatories is the merger of two compact objects, so, so neutron stars uh, and or binary black hole coalescences. Uh, it's expected that, that once advanced LIGO uh, and advanced Virgo reach their design sensitivities, we'll be observing uh, tens of binary neutron star mergers every year. Um, there are quite large error bars on this measurement, so, so this number optimistically could be as large as hundreds of binary neutron stars being observed every year. Um, at the pessimistic end, maybe of order one. Um, uh, an interesting source for, for advanced LIGO and Virgo, and, and really the thing that I want to focus on in, in this talk, because um, binary neutron stars are boring, um, is the merger of uh, a neutron star and a black hole. Um, and the reason that, that these are interesting, uh, as opposed to binary neutron stars, is, is that no neutron star black hole systems have, have yet been observed anywhere in the universe. Um, it is likely that advanced LIGO will make the first direct detection of, of this kind of system. Um, even though we haven't observed these kind of systems directly, we can use population synthesis models to try to predict how many of these systems we, we expect to observe with, with, with advanced LIGO. And, and we kind of get numbers from 0.2 at the, the pessimistic end to about 300 every year at the optimistic end with, with a realistic number uh, being somewhere in the middle. Um, Making the first and hopefully repeated observations of, of these kind of systems will, will really allow us to, to try and unlock a wealth of knowledge uh, about the, these sources and the sort of physics that underpins them. Um, just to give a few of the highlights, well, it'll let us get, kind of get an insight into how neutron star black hole systems form, what, what are the mechanisms responsible for, for, for forming them, um, how, what, what is the sort of internal structure of a neutron star, how, how are they held together. So, so we'll try and learn, maybe learn something about the neutron star equation of state. Um, try and answer the question of uh, are neutron star black hole systems progenitors of, of short gamma ray bursts? Uh, and if they are, what fraction of short gamma ray bursts are, are then formed by neutron star black hole mergers? Um, and also, maybe probe a bit deeper, do, do neutron star mergers produce a significant amount of the sort of our process nuclei that, that we see in the, the universe today? So just to say a few more words about the advanced LIGO detectors and, and try and answer why we didn't see any neutron star black hole mergers with the initial LIGO. Um, here I show the, the sensitivity curves of the um, initial LIGO and Virgo instruments and also the advanced LIGO, um, advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo instruments. Um, and, uh, the X, so we've got frequency against sensitivity. Uh, really, the, the most important thing to take out of this is all of the curves have dropped down by a factor of 10. So we are going to be sensitive to a factor of 10 greater distance because of this, which means a factor of 1,000 times as much universe. And then this is really the reason why we didn't see anything before. We, we simply weren't sensitive enough. But with this sort of 10 times increase in sensitivity and 1,000 times greater volume, we should be at the levels where detecting compact binary systems is, is routine. Um, it's also worth pointing out that, especially for the, the LIGO detector, the, the advanced noise curve is, is 
quite a bit wider than, than the original noise curve. So this will kind of let us probe uh, much earlier in, 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 in the inspiral process and also much later during the, the, the final measure itself, which uh, observing much more of the systems we're trying to, trying to see will let us understand a lot more about the underlying physics and maybe answer some more of the questions that I, I listed on the previous slide. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of spikes that, that aren't shown as well. The, these are sort of violin modes, uh, power lines, so, so you get a bunch of resonances where, where things vibrate at specific frequencies where we simply don't have any sensitivity. We don't have any sensitivity at the power line frequency, so, so 60 hertz and its multiples in advanced LIGO and 50 hertz and its multiples for advanced Virgo just because that, that's going to hit resonances in, in various things. So, so, so these are uh, sort of instrumental in origin, just, just lines that we, we have no sensitivity to. There's much more. I mean, when when we get the real detector noise curves, there's going to be a bunch more lines than, than these ones. Um, I think the advanced LIGO noise curve didn't bother to show most of the lines that are actually going to be there. It, it'll be a forest of them. Okay, so what am I trying to answer then in, in this talk? Well, we already have a, a number of well-established methods for observing and rapidly observing um, systems where the components have no angular momentum, which we commonly call spin. Um, this works by match filtering the data we get uh, against the data we take from our gravitational wave interferometers uh, against models of what we expect the, these systems to, to look like um, without any effects of the components angular momentum taken into account. Now, this approach should be pretty good for binary neutron stars. We don't expect neutron stars to be spinning that rapidly, at least not rapidly enough that it'll have any effect on, on our ability to detect them. So we're pretty good at least for the, really the, the, the thing we expect to see. The thing we'll be really surprised if we don't see with advanced, leg, uh, advanced LIGO. Um, but for neutron star black hole systems, this, this spin has the potential to be very important, and that's what we want to explore a, a bit further in this talk. So, so, so what we really want to do is we know that the approach we use now has some sensitivity to neutron star black hole systems where the spins are significant. But we want to try and quantify how much this is, identify if there are sort of neutron star or populations of neutron star black hole systems that we're not sensitive to, identify where these are, and, and try and ide uh, identify how to improve our searches to deal with this and, and really to, to observe the maximum amount of these kind of systems that, that we can do in the advanced detector era. So before we go into this, it's kind of worth considering what we already know about the spins in, in neutron star black hole systems. So, so when we discuss spins, we, we normally do it in terms of this dimensionless spin, which is uh, what we call chi, which is the uh, spin angular momentum divided by the mass squared. Um, for, for black holes, th this value cannot be bigger than one. Um, for neutron stars, it, it might theoretically be possible that you could push a neutron star to spin faster, but realistically it'll basically break up. It won't be able to support itself if the spins get larger than, than 0.7. Um, but this is really just, just the limit. Uh, at birth, neutron stars really shouldn't be spinning faster than 10 milliseconds, which is a, a value of about 0.05, um, which is almost irrelevant for in terms of gravitational wave detection searches. Um, it is possible they could be spun up by accreting matter, so you talk about uh, recycled millisecond pulsars. Um, those kind of spins aren't completely irrelevant, um, but it isn't clear how the neutron star could accrete matter in a neutron star black hole system when you expect the black hole to form first. Um, so it's kind of a different story, though, with, with the black hole spin. So there are limited, number, limited observations of black hole spins measured from um, X-ray binary systems, and, and in these systems, we, black hole spins have been observed up to, to sort of the maximum possible value. Um, in fact, it, it seems that there's almost a tendency for the black holes to have large spins, though this could just be a, a, an observational bias. Um, the distribution of the black hole spin with respect to the orbital angular momentum isn't well known. Um, hopefully, gravitational wave observations can help us to constrain this and, and understand uh, how this works, but, but really if you want to put any sort of prior on this, you, you kind of have to choose uh, an isotropic one. Um, and again, this spin will affect the emitted gravitational wave signals, and, and this isn't something that we've taken into account in, in previous searches on our data. Okay, so, so what actually changes with spin then? So the coupling between the component's angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum cause, cause a number of effects or differences in, in, in the emitted gravitational waveform that, that we observe with, with the sort of LIGO detectors. 
Um, first, and, and maybe most importantly, uh, it changes the, the, the frequency evolution of the system and, and therefore also the frequency of the gravitational waves that are emitted by the system. Uh, now, this is kind of key because match filtering relies on us knowing the frequency evolution um, pretty accurately. If, if we don't get this right, then, then the match filter searches basically don't work. Um, so, so to understand this, we, we kind of need to consider how frequency will evolve with time for, for emerging system. Um, so the equation here represents the, the frequency evolution of, of an inspiraling compact binary system. Um, you can see it's a... Uh, here, here, omega is, is the angular frequency, and, and this is just written as a sort of expansion in terms of m omega to the two-thirds. Uh, this m is, is a combination of the masses that, that, that's given by chirp mass, so we, we call chirp mass even. Um, when you're far away from merger and, and the velocity of the system is pretty small, um, this is really just dominated by, by this first term. Uh, and this explains why in, in measurements of these systems, this chirp mass will... will determine pretty accurately. This will generally determine with, with very high accuracy. Um, but as the second combination of the masses only comes in at, at subdominant order, we don't measure that quantity as well. And, and therefore, if you're interested in the component masses, which I guess most people are, we, we'll kind of struggle to, to measure this well and therefore struggle to measure the component masses particularly well. Um, when you add spin into the picture, you get a couple of extra terms added here at, at subdominant order. So it's not so important early on in the in-spiral, but as you get nearer and nearer to merger, the, the effect of these spin terms becomes increasingly important. Why is chirp is not similarly um, So the, the frequency evolution of the system doesn't depend on the inclination, um, yeah. because the inclination, the, the inclination is, is just... Uh, I mean, it isn't a property of, of the intrinsic system. It's just a property of how we observe it. It, it will affect... It will give you a phase shift. Sure. So, sure. So, so, so these terms in here will will depend on the the angle between the, the black hole spin and the and the orbit. So, so if the there's a 90 degree angle between the black hole spin and the orbit, um, this term will, will go to zero and, and it will affect. So, so, so these are just came sort of accounted in here. Okay. So uh, a second effect then of the spin is that it it just affects the amount of energy that's lost the gravitational waves and, and therefore the the amplitude of the emitted gravitational wave signal. Um, this really isn't so important. It, it, the variations in amplitude are less than 10% at most, and, and it really doesn't matter so much if we get the amplitude evolution right. We, we really need to get the phase evolution is kind of the key. Um, a third effect, and, and one I want to kind of talk a little bit about more in, in this talk, is, is if the component spins aren't aligned with the orbital angular momentum, then the orbital plane will, will process. Um, and it can be difficult for us to capture this with the waveform models that we use in searches, as I'll talk a little bit more about later. So, so just to try and illustrate this, for, for most cases, um, if a binary is processing, it, it undergoes what we call simple precession. So if you have an angle here, J, which describes the total angular momentum, the, the orbit plus the spin, which would be somewhere over here, um, the system will process as L kind of rotates around J in, in almost a constant cone. The angle here between L and J doesn't really vary very much over time. Some energy is emitted as gravitational waves, so, so you are losing energy from the system, which is why it does change. But if you assume that this is constant, you, you can pretty much get away. It's pretty much a fair approximation to make. Um, a lot of the time, the angle between these, these two vectors is, is very small. Um, for it to be large, you need the, the, obviously the spins to be large, but you also need a higher mass ratio. If you don't have a high mass ratio, um, the orbital angular momentum is often much larger than, than the component spin's angular momentum, and, and it just sits very close to here. Um, it's also worth briefly mentioning uh, the, the second case, which is what we call transitional precession. So it is possible to set up a system where basically the spins and angular momentum almost cancel each other out, so the total angular momentum is close to zero. Um, if this happens, there really isn't sort of an axis for the, the thing to process around. Um, and the spins and the orbit basically tumble until some more energy is emitted as gravitational wave, um, the total angular momentum grows larger, and simple precession begins again. Um, detecting systems that are doing this will be extremely difficult, um, but thankfully it's, it's pretty rare. We, we, we don't expect that this kind of system will happen, um, and it isn't something that we exclude in what I quote later, but it isn't something that we, we are unduly concerned about. Sure. 
Sure, yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in most cases, you, you kind of need that high mass ratio. You need to set up the system so that you, you really need two significant spins in play here. If you just have one pointed away, there is nowhere for it to process around anyway. Yeah, I mean, for, for an SVH, it's hard because you'd probably, if you'd probably be talking about a binary black hole system or a system with neutrons that are having reasonably significant spin. I think it's. I think someone's done it with initial LIGO. I, I think it was done, but I, I will, I'm not convinced it was an overly physical system. I, it might have been very high spinning neutron star or something like that. Um, I can't really say anything more than that. Uh, okay, so, so so maybe it's kind of a bit easier to, to see this in terms of the, the actual waveform that, that's given off. So, so plotted here is, is gravitational wave strain. Um, you can always scale this just by changing the distance, so units here aren't relevant. Um, and then we plot sort of 20 milliseconds of time. Um, here I've chosen um, a system where both the masses are three solar masses. Um, the, the blue trace then is the gravitational wave uh, that would be given off if neither of the components had any spin. Um, and the green trace is what you get if um, both of the binaries have the maximally possible allowed value of spin and it's aligned with the orbital angular momentum. Um, we start the, the t equals zero here corresponds to the frequency of both of these traces being at 40 hertz, and it doesn't look particularly interesting at this point. Um, but if I set it playing, which should work, or oh, doesn't seem to be working, playing, no, well that worked well. There we go. Okay, so if we set it playing, you can see that sort of in the the first second. Not much interesting is going on. They basically the same thing. Um, as we get closer to merger, you see a, a slight phase offset beginning to develop. This is the, the effect of the spin. Um, this phase offset gets larger and larger. And now as we get in closer and closer to merger, you can see that they, they really don't resemble each other at all. Um, the amplitudes are now beginning to vary as the non-spinning system is getting closer to actually merging. Um, we play this on a little bit further. And the non-spinning system will merge. And then about half a second later, the aligned spin system will merge again. Um, now, this is kind of important. It means that the spins on the, the, the fact that the aligned spin system has the, these high spins has, has almost held it up. It's taken half a second longer to merge. So it's emitting gravitational wave energy for, for half a second longer. And therefore, it's given off more power, and we can see them further. So if, if we do the searches right, we will expect to see more of these aligned spin systems than non-spin systems, just because we can see them further. Um, we can set up a, a second case then. OK, so, so, so here, um, the same thing again, uh, except here I've chosen a, a neutron star black hole configuration. Um, again, I've set both the uh, non-spin system. I've set a, a case where both the spins are maximal. Probably not realistic for a neutron star, but this is just illustration. Um, and then added a third case in where, um, again, the spins are maximal, but rather than being aligned with the orbit, they're perpendicular to it and perpendicular to each other. So, so trying to maximize precession here. Um, and if I set this playing, you can immediately see the effect that the precession of the system has in the gravitational wave trace that we see um, in a detector. So you can see it jumping up and down. OK, I've exaggerated this by choosing a particularly extreme system. Um, but uh, you can see that while the other two are just going on a sort of simple chirp, the, the amplitude here is, is varying wildly, and, and it jumps all over the place. Um, as we go closer to merger, and it merges, which I missed, um, basically the, the, the processing system and the non-spinning system merge at the same time. Um, this is because we set the system up such that there's no uh, s dot l is 0, so the intrinsic frequency evolution is, is unchanged. Um, again, the aligned spin system merges sort of about half a second later. So uh, I guess I should point out that the spin will also affect the merger and the ring down of a, of a binary merger. Um, however, for what I'm going to talk about here, um, I restrict to considering only neutral star black hole mergers with the black hole mass, mass being less than 15 solar masses. Um, I also assume that the, both of these are, are point particles, sort of ignoring any effects due to the finite size of the neutron star and, and do not include measure ring down in, in the waveforms. Um, this is done because we, uh, th there isn't any sort of generally available um, in spiral and merger and ring down and neutron star finite size 
model to, 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 to sort of predict what, what the radiation given off would, would look like. So we kind of just have to choose the, the best thing that we've got. Um, given the mass ranges that we've chosen, this, this shouldn't be too much of an effect. These things should come in at sort of higher masses and higher mass ratios. But um, it'd be interesting to, to kind of repeat this once these kind of waveforms are available, just to check that that's yeah. true. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so certainly that's, that's true for a line spin. If you, if you put the spins the other way around and align them against the orbit, then the opposite would happen. Right, I mean, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the energy emitted between 15 to 600 hertz or whatever it is for advanced LIGO is, is really what dictates how far we can see these things. Uh, okay, so, so, so I guess what I, what I really want to try and answer is then what would happen if we search for generic neutron star black hole systems and ignored any effects due to spin in the waveform model. Um, so before I can kind of answer this, I, I just want to say a few words about how we actually do searches with, with non-spinning waveform models and, and kind of how this works. Um, so the basis of, of searches for compact binary mergers with gravitational wave observatories is, is to use match filtering. Um, to do this, we, we basically take the, the frequency domain representation of the data recorded by the gravitational wave observatory, multiply it by the frequency domain representation of, of what we're looking for, sort of a template model of a gravitational wave signal, um, weight this according to the fact that we're differently sensitive at different frequencies, um, do this as a, as a function of time and, and just look for any point where you have some sort of excess uh, against the background noise, so, so something like this. Um, uh, this would be reasonably simple if all compact binary mergers look the same. Um, however, as we've kind of explored earlier, uh, the waveform model looks different for, for different values of masses, spins, etc. Orientations, locations. So there are actually 15 independent parameters that describe a spinning neutron star black hole system in a circular orbit, e ignoring any neutron star finite size effect. Um, so even if we neglect the spin components, we still have nine parameters for a non-spinning system. Um, uh, however, we, we can use a number of tricks to, to kind of make this job a, a little bit easier. Um, so the first thing we do is, is kind of restrict ourselves to only considering the dominant mode of the gravitational wave signal. There are these subdominant modes that, that we don't consider here, but really that's kind of 5% or less of the signal power, and, and it, it's common practice to, to just ignore this. Sub so, Um, sort of what you'd say, like the two minus, two minus one, two zero, three one, anything but the dominant two two mode, and two minus two. Um, so, so if we do this, we can express then gravitational uh, a gravitational wave strain given off by a coalescing compact binary as some amplitude um, multiplied by the mass times the frequency, uh, and then multiplied by by some function uh, by, by basically the the evolving phase. Um, the, the interesting thing to note here is that the, the orientation, the six orientation and location parameters either enter here as a constant amplitude shift or here as a constant phase shift. So if I take my waveform model here, which is just the sort of 10 milliseconds before merger, um, with random values of, of the orientation and location parameters, um, and I choose some different value of these parameters and another different value and another different value, all I'm doing is, is just applying a phase offset, offset uh, and then rescaling. So if I want to pick out all of the signal power for any of the systems on the previous slide, all I need to do is perform a match filter with this blue trace and then perform a match filter with the same signal 90 degrees out of phase, which is denoted here by the green phase, and just add them in quadrature. Um, this becomes even easier if I, we consider it from the mathematics because before I was simply taking the real component of this uh, quantity um, the, to do a 90 degree phase shift, I'm basically just multiplying by i. So to do what I to to do the quadrature sum, rather than taking the real component, I just take the complex magnitude. So simple, there we are, six parameters gone. Um, we can also consider the the end time. So if I if I want to uh, put a time shift onto this, I can just add this quantity here. So then if I want to sort of rapidly evaluate this as a function of time, well, I've basically got a Fourier transform here. So there's plenty of 
uh, the FFT routines are basically available in any computing language that, that you want to do this. So I can I can use that then to, to rapidly um, get my my match filter as a function of time. Um, okay, that that leaves leaves us with with just two parameters then the the masses, um, and we don't have a trick to deal with with the different masses. If the mass values are changed, then the intrinsic frequency evolution is changed, and we don't really have there's no trick we can use to, to do, deal with this. Um, we have to use a bank of waveform filters to try and cover the full mass space. Um, so here's an example of this. The, the y and the x-axis show the, uh, the two masses, the M1 and M2. Um, and each dot here represents a, an individual waveform, an individual filter that we use in the surges. So, so the idea here is that um, if there was a signal, non-spinning signal, anywhere within this parameter space, and I search for it using every single one of these dots as a filter, I would pick up at least 97% of the signal power. Um, now we could tune that number to be bigger and we'd need more dots to do it, but at some point you hit a balance where you're just gaining very little for, for quite a significant increase in computational cost. Uh, and We have to find um, a balance somewhere. Uh, note that the points are, are much more dense down here in the binary neutron star region than, than up here for, for binary black holes. This is because if you, you change the binary neutron star masses slightly, you change the signal within the sort of LIGO band, much more quickly than, than if you do the same thing up here for, for binary black holes. But, but that's just a, a result of the, the, the sort of the noise curve that we have for our, for our instruments. Um, and I kind of also have to point out that this is a somewhat simplified picture because I've assumed that the detector's background noise will, will always be Gaussian, and it won't be. Um, instrumental and environmental uh, artifacts can and will couple into to our data channel, and, and these will give large SNR spikes that might look like a real gravitational wave signal, but certainly aren't extraterrestrial in origin. Um, mitigating these effects would, would be quite a detailed talk on its own, but a lot of this is, is done by demanding that, that if we see something loud in, in one observatory and don't see it in any of the others, we, we're not interested. We, we, ha we have to see something loud in at least two of our observatories at the same time for us to be at all interested in it. Um, we also can identify times when we know we expect some, some loud things, like if a, if a train goes by or if there's an earthquake happening, we know we might expect some, some loud events, so we just remove times like that. Um, and also use a, a set of signal-based vetoes to try to identify if what we're actually seeing looks like what we expect to see. Uh, so now we can kind of return to the original question, which was how efficiently can we observe neutron star black hole coalescences if we ignore the component spins in the waveform models that we use to do the search. Um, so we can measure this. We can begin by creating a sort of large set of generic neutron star black hole systems, what we expect from nature, spinning, processing. Um, we can search for these using our, our bank of non-spinning filters, um, determine which of these picks up the largest fraction of signal power, um, compare this to, to the optimal signal power that we would have got had we done a perfect search, and, and this fraction is, is known as the fitting factor. So this, is, this fitting factor is then basically the fraction of the optimal signal power that you recovered with, with your discrete set of, of template waveforms that you use. Um, however, sometimes you might want to quote uh, sort of some average quantities. Um, you could just take, say, the mean value of these fitting factors for, for different bins, but, but this can sometimes be a little bit misleading. Um, systems with the poorest fitting factor, so systems you often recover the worst, uh, are often those that are aligned really poorly, so you, you kind of couldn't see them anyway. So um, in a lot of cases, even if we were to recover all of the signal power, we just wouldn't be able to see it because our sensitive distance is only like a few megaparsecs or something like that. So we can take this, sort of take this, the, the amount of power that the detectors can see into account, weight by that, and, and kind of define a signal recovery fraction, which is then... Um, the fraction of sources that you'd actually see above some fixed threshold um, with the discrete bank of filters that you're using compared to some optimal search where you do it perfectly and, and all the fitting factors are, are one. So it's so a kind of theoretical perfect search. Uh, the last thing we then need is to define a distribution of neutron star black hole signals that we use. So we put in uh, neutron stars uniformly distributed between 1 and 3 solar masses, black holes uniformly distributed between 3 and 15. Um, we choose a uniform distribution in the component spin magnitudes. Uh, neutron star spins up to 0.05, black holes up to 1, sort of the maximum possible value. We choose an isotropic distribution for the component spins, isotropic distribution for orientation location angles. 
Um, we, we, we do this with a couple of different waveform models just to make sure that we don't have any bias due to the choice of waveform that we use to model our signals um, and use the uh, advanced LIGO design sensitivity curve to, to evaluate our results. Um, so this is what we, sh we get then. So this plot here shows the, the cumulative fraction of signals uh, that are recovered with fitting factors smaller than the value on the x-axis. So, so to try and make that make sense, uh, at this point here, 20% of signals will be recovered with less than 70% of their signal power. Uh, at this point here, 50% um, of signals are recovered with uh, less than sort of 87% of their optimal power. What we want is all the signals lying here. So we want the curves to kind of look like this. Um, the black line here is the 97% line, which is the, the, miss, the loss we allow due to the fact that our bank is discrete anyway. So if we, did a, if we just put in non-spinning signals, we'd expect the lines to lie like this. Um, clearly, they don't. Um, so what this kind of says is that 50% uh, of signals have been recovered with 85% or less of their optimal signal power. Um, this might not sound too bad. Uh, I mean, a 15% reduction in the distance we can see. But this does mean that we're sensitive to, to around 40 to 50% less universe. And, and that would reduce our detection rate of these kind of systems by 40 to 50%. Um, we can try and see this a different way. So here we've binned the results in terms of the mass ratio and the black hole dimension of spin. And here we quote the, the, the fraction of signals that we'd actually recover. Uh, first thing to point out is that if the black hole spin is low, the signal recovery fractions are high. This is kind of expected. It just shows that our bank's doing what it should be doing. The, these values are close to 1. The problem is that as the black hole spin gets larger and the mass ratio gets larger, the results get worse and worse. Um, until we get to a point up here where we're only kind of recovering about 20% of systems in this kind of region. So if these X-ray observations are right and black hole spins are expected to be large, say 0.8 or larger, then uh, we kind of got a problem here. Um, so, so just to, to summarize what I said so far, um, if we use a search that... So if we use a search that doesn't include the, the effect of the component spin, then there will be regions of the parameter space, especially those where the mass ratio is high, and obviously when the spins are large, um, where we aren't going to see as many systems as, as maybe we would like. Um, the results are only as good as the waveforms we have. We, we'd like to repeat this with processing, with merger, ring down, neutron star, size effect stuff, but we don't expect our results to change much if, if we do this. Um, and the results obviously depend on, on the distribution of signals that we choose. I mean, if, if we're able to narrow the space we're searching over from, from astrophysical knowledge, then, then the results will be different. And, and this will also make the searches easier because we're, we're searching over a smaller parameter space. So, so the, the the next part of the talk then is is so. Yeah. Uh, to go back to slides. Sure. In the non-spinning case, the uh, mass ratios. Um, what's the feeling of the current waveform models here? For for non-spinning, they're they're not great, um, and you could go into to to a bunch more. We we we. Down in this sort of region, the, the waveform models seem, seem, seem reasonably in agreement. Up here, we, we probably would like some NR waveforms. The, the, the models that we have don't agree with each other particularly well. Um, so, yeah, the, and certainly as we, we come up to here, the, there are some issues that the waveform models don't agree particularly well with each other. Um, so if I model the, wave, model the system using one waveform model and then model it using another and try and figure out how well they agree with each other, I can get some pretty bad results in, in quite a wide swathe of this space. But when I make, if I make this plot with one waveform model and then make it with a second waveform model, I basically get the same plot. So it doesn't look like these results are, are biased based upon anything like that. OK. OK, so, so, so maybe then let's, let's try and do a bit of a gear shift and, and ask, well, how can we deal with this problem? We want to do things better in, with advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo. We really want to be seeing these systems. We, we want to be doing cool astrophysics. So we already have waveform models that, that include effects, even of precession. So, so why don't we just use them in searches? Um, unfortunately, searching with processing waveforms is 
it, it's difficult. It hasn't yet been shown to work efficiently. There have been a number of methods tried. Uh, I've got a few slides on, on that later. However, let's kind of start by, by asking maybe a simpler question. So um, what would happen if I use the simpler model where I restrict myself to considering cases where I do have spins, but it's aligned with the orbital angular momentum? Um, this includes then the effect of the frequency evolution being different, but I avoid any systems that are, that are processing. So, so again, then, we can ask how well we'll be do, uh, detecting the generic systems with, with a bank of these aligned spin waveforms. Um, so, so just a few words then on, on how doing an aligned spin search is, is a little bit different. Um, so it's kind of not. Um, so again, as for non-spinning systems, if, if I vary the, the orientation and location parameters, all I'm really doing is, is applying either a constant phase shift or, or a constant amplitude offset. So my search works exactly as it did before. I, I don't have to change anything. I do basically the same search I did before when, when I use aligned spin systems. The only difference is that before where I had two parameters, the two masses, um, now I have four, the, the, the masses and the spins. So the, the two-dimensional bank I showed earlier now needs to be four-dimensional. Um, it's kind of a few methods around to deal with this. Either this uh, sort of one method that's been around a while is, is basically a stochastic where you throw hundreds of millions of points all across the space and just proceed to remove any that are kind of too close to other ones. Um, there's also a, a newer method which involves trying to create a geometrical lattice to, to cover the space. Uh, the issue with this is that you need your parameter space to be Cartesian and it's difficult to identify what sort of coordinates to choose so that you have a Cartesian space or, or at least something that's approximately Cartesian and you can run with it. But we, we kind of at least found some sort of solution to that recently and, and it does what it work, should have done. The banks produced a smaller than the ones using this method and they cover the space effectively. So um, this problem at least is, is pretty much solved now. So we can then ask again, I've got my bank now of a line spin waveforms. I use the same distribution of, of signals that I did before. Um, how do the results look now? So, so here are the results then using a bank of aligned spin waveforms. So, so again, uh, his fitting factor and the cumulative fraction of signals found with fitting factor smaller than the value on the x-axis. Um, these three lighter lines here are the results we got before with the, the non-spinning uh, waveform model. Um, and here's what we get if you use the, these aligned spin models. So you can see that everything's moved down and they're moving to the right, which is kind of what we want, but they're still not down here, which is where we want them to be. So, so at this point, we've kind of got 50% of signals being recovered with 90 to 95% of the optimal signal power. So this is, this is a lot better, um, but maybe not perfect. Um, and again, you can kind of see this in terms then of, of this signal recovery fraction. Um, it's much lighter now. This is good. Um, we're doing a lot better, especially for systems with lower mass ratio, even up to spins of one. We, we, we would be able to recover pretty much all the systems. Um, but again, as the mass ratio grows and the spin gets larger, you kind of can't ignore precession everywhere. So um, in these kind of regions, maybe we're picking up 50 to 60% of, of the, the sort of optimal amount. Um, at the highest mass ratio, it looks like it's a non-monotonic compared to black holes. Yeah, so, so, so the issue here is that we chose a distribution that was uniform in the component masses, not uniform in mass ratio, which means that the errors grow as we move to the right. At this point here, the errors on each of the individual boxes is quite large, um, which is what explains um, this not being monotonic. Um, if we'd have done more simulations out here, this will even itself out, and you'll just get a monotonic increase to the top right. Um, I, I, and I guess it's worth kind of pointing out that, that part of the issue with this as well is that not only are we missing things, we're also maybe given a bias in, in what we observe. We put out some papers saying, oh, we see lots of systems with small black hole spins or small mass ratios, and Unless we're careful to quote that there is some sort of bias going on here, this, this might cause problems down the line. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so we can also kind of ask where these systems are distributed in terms of the, the various angular momentum vectors. So, so here we use J to denote total angular momentum, L to denote, denote orbital angular momentum, and N the direction to the observer. Um, and we can take the, show the dot products of these. These don't change very much over time, so we can assume they're basically constant. Um, and you can see that the systems that are being recovered the worst, so, so here we restrict to, to all the systems that have fitting, recovered less than 70% of the optimal signal power. Um, and you can see that these basically all lie along, along an arc. Um, the reason for this is that all the way along this arc are cases where the system is in or processes into and out of 
parts where, or orientations where our detector just can't see it. So, so you get the kind, I mean, the, 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 the waveform I showed earlier actually lies here. So you, the, the amplitude is very large, then the amplitude almost drops to zero, and then it grows very large again. So, so these are the cases where the amplitude is varying the most. If it, if it lies anywhere else, the, the variation in the amplitude isn't as much, and the effect of precession is much smaller. Right. So these are, these are also the systems where we would hope to, to disentangle degeneracies that are present with other systems. So observing these kind of systems is potentially very interesting. So we, we would like to answer this question. Um, so, so it kind of leads into to really the, the final question I want to ask then is, is and I, one I don't really have an answer to, unfortunately, is, is how can we search with processing waveforms? Um, so just, just to recap, if we ignore precession, we'll, we'll miss systems that have certain spin configurations, especially these potentially interesting systems. Um, to date, though, no search for processing systems has been run and published using actual data from our observatories, not Gaussian noise, that has increased the detection efficiency relative even to a search with non-spinning waveform models. Um, a number of ideas have been proposed and tested, um, but so far we don't have anything that works. Um, so, so, so just to ask this another way, why is an aligned spin search not simply an extension of, of an aligned spin search in the way you're just adding parameters in? Um, so the issue is kind of the number of parameters that, that you have to consider when, when you're conducting a processing search. So, so for a non-spin search, we have these two parameters. We need about 100,000 template waveforms to cover neutron by black holes. Um, you go to a line spin, you add in two spin amplitudes, and we get about a million templates. Already this is beginning to become difficult in terms of computational cost, but we can probably work with this. Um, if we go to a processing search, we, we get a, at least eight intrinsic parameters. There may be degeneracies here, maybe more. Um, I don't know how many templates there are because we haven't been able to figure this one out yet. Um, we, we don't know how to, to define a Cartesian coordinate system to place a geometric lattice, and the stochastic bank is probably going to take about 10,000 years to actually give us a number. So um, we, we, this, this is a question that, that, that isn't easily, easily solved, but it may not be massively larger than this, but um, it's kind of, we don't have an effective method right now for even for placing a bank of waveforms to cover this space. So. Um, Ideas, that have, ideas that, that have maybe been proposed in the past rely on trying to use unphysical waveform models that capture most of the power of processing waveforms with a reduced number of intrinsic parameters. So, so one of the earlier methods for doing this was, was to use these so-called phenomenological BCV templates that, that were described by only three intrinsic parameters. Um, we tried this in searches in, in early LIGO science runs, and the efficiency was found to be smaller than that even of a non-spinning search. Um, and this was kind of because the, these unphysical waveform models allowed a lot more freedom to match the background noise. Triggers was the, the back, even the background noise was just simply louder because we did this. Um, and we didn't have a, an adequate way of removing these, these non-Gaussian glitches from the data, which, which basically th these two factors combined meant that this search just didn't work. Um, a newer idea was, was this so-called um, physical template family, which isn't entirely physical when it's run on real noise. Um, the idea here is, is to begin by restricting to single spin systems, so you ignore the neutron star spin. This is, this is fine for neutron star black holes. Um, and then you try and decompose the waveform into to five basis vectors, which are described by four intrinsic parameters. The mass is the spin magnitude, and it's the angle between the spin and the orbital angular momentum. Um, different combinations of these five basis vectors and different phase offsets then correspond to different values of, of the extrinsic parameters of the system. Um, the problem here is that maximizing over these five different amplitudes allows, a, again, a lot more freedom to match the noise than, than what you had before. Um, so if I was just to search through Gaussian noise and not have any signals, um, the signal-to-noise ratio for a non-spinning search would, would follow this distribution. Um, if I do this with a PTF search, I, I get a distribution that looks like this. So, so my noise background is a lot louder. Um, my signal strengths get a little bit larger because I match them properly, but I really need, this is only useful if I'm, lose, if I'm not getting, if, if I basically pick up less than 88% of the signal for the optimal signal power um, with my align spin search. If, if I pick up more than that, this, this isn't going to help me. So the, the improvement from, from using a processing search like this isn't as much as we'd like, um, just because of, of this kind of thing here. Um, so, so just to kind of wrap up then, 
Uh, as well as spins, there are other effects that, that might complicate neutron star black hole searches. Um, the, the subdominant modes in the waveform, what about if these things are eccentric? Um, is there any effect due to the fact that neutron stars aren't point particles? They actually have size. Um, are our waveform models accurate in all regions? We, we took a punt at trying to answer this here. Um, and what if the signal isn't quite what we expect? What if GR is not quite right? Will, will this hurt us? Um, so to conclude, uh, we have a lot of experience with, with searches using non-spinning waveform models. We know how to at least conduct searches with, with these aligned spin waveform templates. Um, we've got ideas for how to do this with processing waveforms, but so far nothing that's actually worked. Um, and really detecting all possible systems is kind of vital if we want to do astrophysics in the years ahead. Uh, and also, we, we don't really want observational biases in, in the systems that we observe. So thanks. Uh, I think I'm done. Uh, so, without taking into account precession, i.e. With, with systems that aren't processing, we do not believe you will be able to say you have a neutron star black hole system, full stop. Um, it, you, you will, you will and unless you observe an electromagnetic counterpart, in which case you can rule out the binary black hole model. For, for most cases, um, a neutron star black hole system that isn't processing will be degenerate with a binary black hole system with slightly different spins that isn't processing. If, and if you get cases where the precession isn't very much, this, this might still be true. Um, but maybe for some of those systems that we really have the most trouble seeing, in those cases, maybe, maybe we can say for certain that this is neutron star black hole, or we just see an electromagnetic signal, and unless it's small enough mass that we can confuse it with a binary neutron star, then, then we, we're pretty much sorted. So rapidly sort of following these things up to see if we see something would, would definitely help to do that. It is solved in four dimensions, yeah. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, or at least there is a, uh, a lattice placement called AN star that works. Uh, it's definitely the optimal solution in 3D, um, and I, it's the most optimal known solution in 4D. I, I don't believe that this can be better, but it's only, I think if you go to higher dimensions, it might be possible that, this can, that there could be another lattice placement that is better than this. I, I don't think that's true in 4D, though. That might be... It, it, it's only the, the, the best thing that's available. And, and the placement method is sufficiently to match the neutron star numerals lattices? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, that, the, this was a lot of what we were investigating when, when we, we were doing this work was really, um, do, do, do you have to worry? And, and a lot of the cases, we actually find that even, we, we very rarely use a 4D lattice when we actually place the banks. We, we find it. Um, in a lot of cases, we're actually placing 2D lattices and, and stacking in, in, because you often find that, I mean, because what you've got here is, is almost a four-dimensional subspace in some higher dimensional parameter space, and, and it's some manifold within that. Um, and, and the first thing you try and do is figure out, well, it's wavy and it's curvy, so how can I choose coordinates such that it's as flat as it can be, and, and I orient the directions in the right way? And then you can start assessing how deep it is in, in the third and fourth directions. Um, and often we find that it isn't very deep in even the third, let alone the fourth. So most of our bank placements are actually two-dimensional. The, uh, as, as well as not picking up the optimal amount of SNR, these are going to start failing the various signal consistency checks that we do. So it's even worse than the spot check. So it's even, well, so the approach, in the, the, the approach to this problem in the initial detector era was that we'd loosen all the cuts. We'd make all of it, rather than doing something 
that was focused on detecting non-spinning systems, we went, or we put in processing systems, all these values get larger, all our signal consistency checks start producing bad values. So we'll just make all the cuts slightly worse, which maybe slightly hurts our ability to detect binary neutron star systems, um, but means that these systems here, if they're actually observed at all uh, above our thresholds, aren't thrown away. Um, I'm not sure that's the approach we want to continue to do, but, but that's what we did. And I'm sure we can tune various knobs and things as we start to figure out how to do these searches properly um, in a few years' time. I mean, by the, by the time you've reached a fitting factor of 0.7, though, you've got 0.7 cubed. I mean, that, that's basically zero. So, oh, so it, it, you, we've, we've, we've already lost these systems. All right, well, uh, 